Hello everyone and welcome to the next talk in the Eric Northeast and Tees Valley Wildlife Recorders Conference. Thanks for joining us again. Well, we're really pleased to have Dr. Heather Kell uh, joining us uh, for the to give our talk today. And it's all about um, the, the insights she's got and the time spent revisiting a local nature reserve over um, the course of a year. So I'm really looking forward to this. Whilst this uh, premiere is being broadcast, um, we'll be present. So you'll be able to ask questions or make comments mostly in the chat section. Most people throughout our talks have been using the chat section during the broadcast, but the, the comment you can write in the comment section as well and we'll keep an eye on that. So I'm just gonna ask um, Heather to introduce herself and um, then just go straight into the talk, Heather. So um, thanks for doing this talk. We really um, appreciate it. And um, I'll just hand over to you, Heather, and, and let you get on with it. Thank you. So um, I teach biology at Durham University and my passion is plants. Um, and one of the things I like to do in my spare time is to go out looking for plants with my friends. And this is the second time that I've done this when I've gone to a particular site and looked at it over the course of a year and monitored what I can see and all the changes. And I found it a really enjoyable experience. So this is something I did in 2019, not in this year, um, but I have every plan to do it again, probably next year. So I guess the question is why? Why would I go back to the same place over and over again? And there's several reasons really. One of them is that there's a lot of evidence now for how important it is to get out into a natural environment. Um, I'm very interested in the research by uh, a man called Miles Richardson who works at Derby University and runs something called the Nature Connectedness, Connectedness Research Group. And he writes a really interesting blog called Finding Nature. Um, and what he does is he looks at the impact of nature on people's lives and how important it can be. There's something called um, in psychology, something called three good things, which is a, a positive psychology intervention um, where participants are encouraged to write down three good things a day for a week or two. And it's shown to increase happiness and decrease depression for quite long periods of time because it makes people more conscious of the positive things around them. And what Miles Richardson found was that if he modified this to three good things in nature, then he found that the improvements were even bigger. Um, so he found that the nature group were writing about things like hearing and seeing specific things like um, sparrows chattering in the hedge or sun on the river or something very specific that had really been a positive experience for them. And he found that basically enjoying three everyday things in nature was delivering really sustained improvements in people's mental health and their sense of well-being. So I guess in a pandemic, there's never been a better time to, to think about this. A lot of us are getting out more and doing more um, locally. And I think getting to know a local patch means that you can see small changes across the seasons, which really engage you and make you think. Also from the point of view of Eric, then being a botanical recorder is really important. Um, it helps keep a record of the biodiversity that's there already, and it allows um, any kind of changes to be picked up quickly as well. So any reduction in species that are particularly valuable or anything unwelcome that's appearing in the area that you'd like to know about. I think Fiona will say a bit more about biological recording in general after I've finished. So that's why. Where um, I live just south of Durham and um, I'm really lucky that I live near a number of old quarries in the magnesium limestone and they have really interesting diverse floras and Raysby Hill grassland in particular is just a short bike ride from my house so it was easy to fit it into a sort of regular schedule. Why Raysby Hill in particular? Well it's got one of the last remaining areas of magnesium limestone grassland, primary grassland, um, which has never been developed. It's got an abandoned quarry, it's got ponds and it's got some woodland. So it's got a lot of diversity in the habitats within quite a small area. Ironically, of course, if it wasn't for human activity, the whole thing would just be wildwood. Uh, so the diversity is really a result of, of our activities over a really long period of time. The grassland um, is relatively undisturbed. It's free draining alkaline soil. It hasn't been ploughed or fertilised or sprayed for a very long time. And that's why it supports such a wide range of species lots of lime loving plants, and then the insects and the birds that depend on them too. Uh, Raysby Hill's actually the oldest layer of the magnesium limestone. 
laid down during the Permian. So this is a photograph on the Durham coast looking up towards Souter Lighthouse and towards South Shields. Um, so it was laid down 300 million years ago, this limestone, um, when Britain was part of a hot, arid landmass, very different to now, near the equator, and it was being periodically inundated by the, the Zechstein Sea, which is why you get these layers of limestone. Um, and this layer forms the escarpment that runs along the coast um, from northeast to southwest, really, from South Shield right as far as Newton Aycliffe. And there's a number of quarries along it, and those are where I go. And one of the reasons for Raisby Hill is that it has uh, one of the largest populations in the area of dark red helleborines. That's one of the reasons that makes it a, a triple SI. So how did I do this? Well, there's a fixed route that I walk through the reserve once a month, roughly, um, noticing as much as possible and photographing and listing what I found in flower. So this is the, the first part of my route and that's January, then the same place in May, in June, in August and November. So just to give you a, an idea of what one piece of grassland can, how it can change over the course of a year. And that's what I found so fascinating really. So um, this is a map of the reserve and I entered the reserve where the red arrow is on the, on the map there. Um, walked through some short grass, which is that first meadow I've just showed you, um, and then up the hill towards the top of the reserve. And then at the top, there's a limestone scree slope, which is another very different habitat. And then you cross that and down into the old quarry. And then you can follow the cycleway back through the woods a bit and into the, the lower end of the reserve, which goes along Raisby Beck and a marshy area. So a really wide range of habitats. But I think you can see that if you, if you came in um, January, perhaps, when it looks like this, you might really not think it was a very special place. Um, so that's the scree and the meadow in January. Um, and also I found that it looked a lot smaller when you could see all the boundaries as clearly as you can in the winter time. So I'd always been in the summer before and I was really interested to go and see how it would change through the course of the year. So January was a bit of a revelation to me because in summer, when the grass is long and full of flowers, you don't even notice that there's many mosses and ferns because they're, they're kind of swamped by other things. So the damper areas of the reserve really come into their own in, in January. So things that you don't normally see, you notice, which is a good thing. Um, in January, I just found two things in flower. I found angelica and white dead nettles. But what I also noticed was that the seed heads are there and the seed heads are very beautiful in their own right. So in terms of getting a, an image of what's to come, and also just enjoying the natural beauty that's there, even in the middle of winter, um, looking for the seed heads is, is a good thing to do. There are also lots of new leaves just appearing. So um, this is salad brunette, but there were wild strawberries and dog violet and so on, just appearing through the, through the bits of um, moss. So you can see what's coming. February, I chose an interesting year to do this because this is um, the area around Raisby Beck in the photograph. And what's happened here is that there was a Fenland area there and it's got overgrown uh, over the years. And so in February, the Durham Wildlife Trust who managed the site got an excavator in and they came along here, stripped off the topsoil, cut back a lot of the vegetation um, to get the excavator in, stripped off the topsoil, and then they're going to attempt to restore the fens. So it was a good, good year to have a look at the site. Um, one of the funny things that I came across on this particular day when I visited in February was a notice on the gate to say that there had been a pony detained under the Control of Horses Act 2015. Um, I don't know what had happened to the pony, but apparently somebody had just left it on the reserve to fend for itself. Um, so going through the reserve at this time of year, there's not very much to see in flower. Um, the only thing that you might find in flower are catkins of uh, trees. I did find a hazel tree that just about had some some anthers sticking out of the male catkins, but that was a bit of a um, bit of a, a a long shot, really, to call that a flower. Um, what you do see, obviously, at this time of year, is the beautiful silhouettes of the of the trees that haven't got leaves and the colour of the new growth shining through that. So even even in a dull day, it's it's still a beautiful place to be. Where there are branches and they're bare, then you, often you can see um, a lot of yellow colouring. So you see lichens like Xanthoria um, and sometimes, so those lichens don't need much to grow. They, they basically rely on um, 
carbon dioxide from the air, which the algal partner fixes, and um, water and a few minerals that the fungal partner takes up, and they can grow on virtually nothing. So they're real pioneer organisms. And where those lichen have become established and been able to generate a little bit of soil, retain a little bit of water, then you get beautiful little moss gardens. So you can see a little bit further up the branch there, there's some mosses starting to, to take over where the lichens had first appeared. Perhaps the loveliest thing that I found in February was the, the bracts of a self heel seed head that had lost its, lost everything else, lost the seeds. Um, but these are just very beautiful things to look at. So March is a time when things start to, to change rather more. So um, some of the trees are now starting to come into flower. So the goat willow, which is the thing that produces the, the lovely um, pussy willow catkins, the male catkins, or the, the fluffy ones with the yellow anthers sticking out. And the female catkins, like the one on the right, are rather more subtle. We don't really see what's happening there. Um, the were hazel catkins, they've all finished flowering now, and the goat willow's taken over. Big excitement for me, which is a bit of a, a misnomer, is finding common whitlow grass, which I'd never found before. I did the BSBI identiplant course the previous year, and this was something I was looking for. It's a very, very tiny um, brassica, a very tiny crucifer. Um, and you can see the thing on the left hand side of the picture there is a rabbit dropping. So that gives you some idea of the scale of the plant and why it's not that easy to find unless you're really looking for it. So I was very excited to find this. Not that it's a rare thing, but still nice to find. There are lots of new leaves appearing in March. So primroses, orchid rosettes, lots of cuckoo pine coming up in the woodland. And there's now an area of open water that's being created as part of the Fenland. So you can see that where they've had the excavator in, um, you've got a, a an area of open water and it's been loosely dammed at one end with some of the log trees. There's nothing growing there at the moment, it's very bare, but you can see that the rich looking soil that's piled up against the side of it is going to have a good reservoir of seeds and you can predict that um, in a little while there's going to be plenty of interesting vegetation there. A few of the leaves have started to, um, a few of the hawthorn trees have started to, to burst bud now and they're showing a lovely bright green colour, but most trees are still bare. One thing you do see is some orange colouring, which is um, the bark of a lot of the silver birch trees are covered in this bright orange um, algae called Trentopolia, which is actually a green alga, believe it or not, but it's one of the fungal partners in a lot of lichens. And you find it all the year round, but you notice it in the, in the winter when the trees are bare, you notice it on the bark. And this particular batch was on the, on the ground in the scree area. Again, it's the kind of thing that's going to be screened out as soon as there are any bigger plants around, they'll shade it out. So it's just making hay while the sun shines. By April, the first meadow that I walk through is now full of lesser celandine, so it's beautiful yellow. And then as I go up the hill, then the Whitlow grass is joined by some other species. So blue moor grass on the right there, which has a really metallic blue kind of um, tinge to the seed heads, beautiful thing, is, is rare in lots of places, nationally scarce, but it's common on this carboniferous limestone grassland. So it's quite an easy thing to find in County Durham. Um, the petal, the, the violet on the bottom left-hand side is a hairy violet rather than a common dog violet. And the sepals on the back of the flower are much more blunt tipped and the, the, um, the bit at the back with the nectar in it is also a kind of blunt shape and the, the plant's more hairy as you might expect. But hairy violets are a little bit earlier than the common dog violets really in appearing. There's lots of colt's foot and um, gorse flowering now, and there's banks full of dog violets and barren strawberries too around the old quarry. And the vegetation is starting to appear around the restored fen area, and the first hawthorn is also really starting to bud, burst its buds now. The mosses are much less obvious because they're having to compete a bit harder for the water and the light they need. So whereas they were really obvious in January, now the bigger plants are taking over and other things are starting to be much more prevalent. And in April, I found 12 species in flower. So it's kind of increasing quite dramatically by this point. However, May is the time that things really seem to take off. So this is all things that were found in that first meadow, which looks so bare in January. Water ravens, crosswork, cowslips. Um, more violets, bugle, a real diversity of um, flowering plants, and even a really sleepy um, butterfly, which is 
sitting there I think because it's a bit of a cold wet morning it hasn't done very much it's a good time to be looking for them for dopey orange tip butterflies. When I walk up the hill then there was blackthorn flowering and wayfaring tree is now starting to take over from that and I find lots of alcamilla ladies mantle and lots more violets and strawberries among the cowslips and then when I get to the scree at the top you can see that's starting to get a kind of green tinge to it too. So you can see on the left hand side top picture there's some sort of scrubby willow starting to grow on the scree. That's obviously going to be a bit of an issue because this is a habitat that's special for a number of smaller plants and it's an interesting kind of dilemma for a conservationist. If you let natural succession take its place it might be good for some kinds of biodiversity but it will rule out some of the species which are happy there at the moment. Um, on that screen, I find the first common spotted orchids of the year and lots more strawberries. And then when I go into the woodland area, I find sanicle and cuckoo pint growing. So sanicle on the top is an umbellifer. It doesn't really look like one, but when you look closely at those flower heads, you can see that they are actually really tiny flowers and they're grouped in umbels like the other umbellifers. Uh, sanicle's called that because it's supposed to have a wound healing property. So sanus is Latin for healthy and the root of words like sane. And if you look in Geoffrey Grigson's Englishman's Flora, it cites one herbal that has a recipe for a wound drink made of sanical yarrow and bugle, which I have to say I've never tried, but the bugle is supposed to hold the wound open, the yarrow is supposed to cleanse it and the sanical to heal it. I don't know whether anybody's ever done any, any research into those properties, whether they're real or just putative properties. In the woodland as well, there's the cuckoo pint, and a bigger diversity of, of colours than I've ever seen before in the, in the bracts, in the spathes. Um, so the one on the right has got a very red coloured um, bract really around the spike of flowers. The flowers themselves are actually at the base of that um, spadix, which is the sort of protruding bit, and they're quite well hidden. I did intend to cut one open and have a good look, but I never quite got round to that, so maybe this year. Um, most of the cuckoo pint's common names refer to it as likeness to, likeness to uh, genitalia, but the Latin name um, maculata means that it's got spotted leaves. Obviously it has very bright red berries in the autumn and the winter, um, and they're packed with, with crystals of oxalate, which are really irritant to skin, mouth and the tongue, and can cause a lot of problems if people eat them. Although I think they're nasty enough that people don't usually eat enough to have any problems, any serious problems. Um, June is even more dramatic. So the meadow is now full of crosswork, water ravens and other things, cowslips and so on. Um, and there's lots of orchids there as well now. The wood and water ravens are interesting because they're both um, GM species and they hybridize really frequently. So you don't just get the, the standard um, little yellow wood avens, you get these hybrids like this one, which is kind of in between with a nodding head, but yellow petals. And you also get some very spectacular um, double and triple flowered ones with the orange flowers too. They hybridize really freely, basically, give you all kinds of intermediate shapes. Maybe the orchids are the most special thing in June. So, in the meadow, uh, there's heath spotted orchid, which is on the top left there. Um, it's got conical shaped flower spikes, which become cylindrical as they get more mature. Um, the lip on each flower is only slightly lobed and the middle bit is a bit shorter. The central lobe is a bit shorter than the other side lobes. Um, and then on the bottom, you have a, a northern marsh orchid, which has a really short spike, but deeper purpley color. And in this case, the middle lip is middle uh, lip of lobe of the lip is a bit longer than the side lobes so it's similar looking but when you get your eye in quite distinctive. Um, the tway blades on the right hand side there you can see the flower which looks like a little person. Um, tway blades are much easier to spot by their leaves than they are by the flowers really. You can see they're green and quite well camouflaged but they have these really big um, oval basal leaves and you can spot those quite readily if you, if you know what you're looking for. It's a really common um, European orchid and it's really promiscuous in the relationships it has both with pollinators and with the mycorrhizal fungi that it needs to germinate and for the seedling to grow. So because of the shape of the flowers then lots of different parasitic wasps and sawflies and beetles can collect the pollinia which are the bags of pollen uh, and distribute them to other plants. Um, 
they lie free on top of a thing called a rostellum, which separates the male and female parts. And its job generally is to stop the um, cross the, the self fertilization of the flower. So when an insect touches this rostellum, then the plinia end up glued to its body um, by a kind of sticky liquid, and then it will carry it to another flower. Generally, orchids have really tiny dust like seeds and they don't have any endosperm, which is the bit that normally feeds the embryo as it starts to, to grow. So most of them rely on a fungal partner to supply water and nutrients right from the very beginning, really. So these were all in the meadow. And then as I moved up the hill a little bit, um, there's a common spotted orchid too. So you can see it's got paler flowers, although that's not always the case, and a really long uh, middle lip there. But for me, the real excitement on the scree slopes is actually the first time I've seen wild columbines. So aquilegia, granny's bonnets, whatever you want to call it. There's these lovely dark purple wild columbines that grow on the slope there. I've never seen those before. The, the whole of the scree is actually now quite yellow with lots of rock roses, bird's foot trefoil, hawkweeds and so on um, amidst all the willow. But there's also blue patches which are milkwort, blue or purple, uh, lots of wild thyme, some campion as well. So the, the, the scree slope is a, is a beautiful, um, beautiful area at this time of year. I'm going, going from basically look like dry ground with nothing growing on it at all in January, February, March. It's now a real feast for the eyes. July, come back to the meadow again. And now what was crosswort and water ravens and so on is now meadow sweet and um, also some marsh thistles. And instead of the orchids which were there before, there's now lots of fragrant orchids. They've replaced most of the common spotted in the northern marsh orchids. There's lots of tway blades still there. Some of them grow really big, almost as tall as my knees. Um, the fragrant orchids in the UK used to be lumped together as a single species, but they've been recently split into three. But frankly, it's beyond my ability to reliably tell the three apart. What you do see with them is they all have a really long spur on the back of the flower that carries nectar. And what that means is that because the spur is so long, only uh, butterflies and moths that have a really long proboscis can reach it. And so it's pollinated by a much narrower range of species than the things like the tway blade. You can see that this burnet moth, which is on a fragrant orchid, you see it's got two tiny yellow blobs on its proboscis. And those are pollinia that it's picked up from another orchid and is going to be depositing on the, on the second orchid. So you can see how it carries out fertilization. I suspect that the fact there are so many fragrant orchids on the site is partly responsible for the fact that there are lots of moths and butterflies on the site. And then at the same time, that works the other way around too. So I think that the, the number of butterflies and moths is probably responsible for the reason that the fragrant orchids set seeds so successfully and they're so abundant on this site. In the grassland, when you go up the hill, again, the species have changed a bit. Masses of betony, century, um, harebells, and a few bee orchids, um, which are always lovely to see. And also some fairy flax, which is a really tiny member of the flax family. You have to look really carefully to see it. It's proper, proper like a wildflower meadow instead of a pictorial meadow that you could buy the seeds for. This is a, a proper, um, very diverse batch of, of meadow flowers. The scree slopes and the, the quarry again have their, their own range of species. So in the, in the more nu nutrient poor short grass conditions, you get vipers bugloss, um, yellow wort, carline thistles, which again are a, a lime loving plant. And then when you go into the quarry itself, the first time I've seen wild basil, and another orchid to add to the list. So this is the, the ninth orchid I think that I've seen on the site this year. And also in July, if you're lucky, you see the first of the dark red helleborines. So again, these are quite rare elsewhere, but in County Durham on the magnesium limestone grassland, they're not so rare. And there are many here. Durham Wildlife Trust do a, a count one day towards the end of July or in August. Um, and, and they monitor the population here because it's the largest colony in County Durham. Walking along by the beck, 
it's now starting to look very different. So where it was bare ground, where the um, excavator had been in, there's now masses of things growing. A lot of opportunistic plants, so uh, willow herbs, a lot of bracken, a lot of perforate St John's work, which is the yellow in the picture, but also lots of valerian and meadowsweet. And again, these are good plants for pollinating insects. While I'm there, um, Durham Wildlife Trust have got people out clearing the paths with strimmers, so it's really noisy, but you can see that maintaining the, the reserve needs that kind of level of intervention. I think I found 80 species in flower in July, so you can see that it's, it's really taking off by this stage. Lots of wildlife too, in terms of uh, smaller things, so bee flies, uh, tiny spiders, range of butterflies, painted ladies, um, fritillaries, meadow browns, peacock butterflies, skippers and others. I'm no expert in, in butterflies, but even I can tell that there's a, a huge diversity of insects there, which is, I can enjoy even if I can't tell you what they are. By the time we get to August, then starting to feel just a little bit melancholy. You can feel that autumn's just around the corner. Um, there's plenty of meadow sweet and knapweed and so on flowering still in the meadow, but a lot of plants have now set seed, including the meadow sweet, which has these beautiful um, twisted spiral groups of seeds. Each of those bars on the spiral is actually a, an individual seed and they're kind of twisted around one another. By August, there's about half the number of species flowering that were flowering in July. And a lot of those, although I'm counting them as flowering, I really only got one or two um, late specimens visible. And I think that the cobwebs covered in dew in the morning kind of tell me that it's getting towards the end of the season. On the screen though, there's still a few new arrivals. Devil's Bit Scabious, which is one of the, the later uh, meadow plants appears. Beautiful um, blue flowers and the first autumn gentians are appearing. So they, they like the scree habitat with, with not too much competition and a few small wax cap mushrooms too. Along by the beck, Again, you can see how um, dense the coverage of things like willow herb and bracken now is. And obviously that's going to be something that the Wildlife Trust are going to need to manage if they're going to restore the fen in the way they want it to do. There's still plenty of standing water, which is a good sign in late August. So obviously they've been successful in, in maintaining that. Um, the conditions will obviously be good for establishing more wetland vegetation, as long as they can keep these weedy ruderals in check. In the woods, the fruits are ripening, so you get rose hips and you get the, the very kind of orange red fruit of the cooker pine. Surprisingly little of that, considering how many plants there were when I first visited in the spring. So the red's a good warning colour for us of the toxicity, but it's also a good way of attracting the animals and the birds, which are going to disperse the seeds when they, they eat the fruit and then they disperse the seeds within. By September, it's definitely autumn. Um, I did find 20 plants still in flower, including this agrimony, but mostly that's just a, a few individuals, really. You can see that the meadow at the top there has been cut back, um, and that will allow the new vegetation to, to compete with the grasses, so the grasses are being kept in check a little bit. Um, they've also got some Exmoor ponies on the site now in the area around the ponds. And that happens every year, I think, on many of the reserves around County Durham. Um, and the job of the ponies is basically to stop things from taking over. So the meadow suite and the agrimony around the ponds are being kept in check by them. And if you look at what's in their mains, you can tell what's in seed at the moment. So they've got lots of lots of interesting things in their mains. The only things that um, are really in flower, there's a few things that are producing a second flush, but most of the most of the main batch of flowers have now gone over. And the bracken along the beck is turning this lovely golden colour. More wax cut mushrooms too, including these beautiful scarlet ones. So still in September, although it feels like things are turning, there's still new things that I haven't seen before and that I haven't noticed before. By the end of October, when I visit, um, there's been a couple of frosts and some strong winds. So a lot of the trees have lost their leaves, but the silver birches are the exception to that. They still have this beautiful golden color in the low sun. The scrubby seedlings that are developing on the scree, as I said before, do pose a bit of a threat to the habitat for things like the dark red helleborines, although they are good in terms of other general biodiversity. So in October, 
I'm still finding um, things like clover and flower, a little bit of knapweed and some harebells and some more wild thyme. But the seeds are probably the most interesting bit. So lots of seed heads and berries, including these kind of traffic light coloured uh, bittersweet heads and plenty of interesting uh, members of the daisy family producing their seeds now too. Most of what's in flower in fact are, are in the daisy family, the asteraceae, so things like nipplewort, pork bits uh, and so on. When I visit in November, it's a really cold day. It's, there's been a really hard frost um, and the temperatures stay below zero most of the day. One of the things that I realised, which I hadn't particularly realised before, is that the whole site faces north. So this is around the middle of the day and it's still in shade and still frozen really. So there's nothing in flower when I visit in November, but lots of beautiful leaf colours and seed heads with ice crystals dusting them. The Exmoor ponies have got these fantastic fringes to keep themselves uh, to keep the, their eyes and their faces warm but they're really hungry because the ground's frozen and when I try to get my camera out of the pocket take a photograph they think it's food so I have to move on fairly quickly. <laughs> I still enjoy it though because look at how, look how beautiful the ice crystals are they're around the edges of the leaves and along the veins and so on. Um, when leaves are in danger of freezing then the plant takes the water or pushes the water out of the out of the leaves and into the into the conducting tissue, the xylem, and then out around the edges into, into through any, any pores and stuff, because if the water's in the leaf and it freezes, when it expands and crystals form, it's likely to damage the cells. So the plant's quite keen to get as much water as possible out of the leaf before that happens. It does make for some beautiful photos. Then my last visit in December, it's much milder, you can see. Uh, lots of new green leaves. We found one dead nettle in flower, that was all. The mosses start to be more obvious again. And if you look at where they're growing, so sometimes they're on the on the bare scree, and these ones are forming like miniature rock gardens on top of some of the limestone boulders in the quarry. And you can see very easily here where the fertilizer for these mosses is coming from, by the fine collection of rabbit droppings. Um, what amused me was that the automatic picture, the automatic caption that came up when I tried to uh, load this picture up was that it was a pile of broccoli sitting on a rock. I don't know what they think that is. There's also lots of um, deer hoof prints on the path through the woods at this time of year. You can see more on the ground because there's less actually growing. The Fenland area on the right there you can see is starting to look a bit more settled. Um, there's a pe permanent area of open water and that's already been colonised by an aquatic buttercup and there's some brook lime growing there too. So it's nice to see that that process, which started in February with the whole area being dug out, has now reached some kind of um, stability. So what did I learn about Raisby Hill? Um, well, I found that walking in the reserve once a month was, was really fascinating. So the top graph there shows the number of species I found in flower, and that comes with a big proviso that there's many things that I wasn't able to identify, many grasses, for example, that I'm really bad at identifying. So the numbers are much higher, but you can get a picture of how much the diversity is more apparent in the summer than the winter there. Um, the bottom graph is just showing the plant families that were represented because I was curious. Uh, you can see that there are many, many of the Asteraceae, which are the daisies, uh, lots of the rose family, lots of the bean family, the pea family. Um, partly that's just to do with the number of uh, species that there are in each of those families. The Asteraceae are a really huge plant family, but also things like the peas and beans are able to fix their own nitrogen so they can survive really well in quite low nutrient habitats. So I found 123 different species um, in total flowering. Um, what's quite interesting about Raisby Hill is because it's got no road verges and the pond areas are fenced off, there's things missing that you might expect to find there. Um, other places that I've been to, then uh, things like dandelions and daisies, you don't really find things that grow on, on road verges in kind of weedy areas. So those are missing, but there's plenty of other interesting things to see. I was really excited to see the common whitlow grass, as I've said, and the wild columbine, um, and the wild basil as well, which was a new one to me. I was really amazed by the range and the abundance of the orchid species that were there. So that was nine species. Uh, and I suspect many hybrids too that I wasn't capable of recognising. I really enjoyed the butterflies and the moths associated with the diversity 
in June and July, even if I couldn't really identify what I was finding. What else did I enjoy and learn? Well, I found it was really, really good to get out and see the changing seasons. Um, even on a dull day, and there were many, I felt much better for getting out and doing something. There's always something new to see that you haven't seen before. Um, and looking back at the photos, it's been a really positive experience preparing for this talk. I have a camera with a very good macro lens on it and taking pictures with that is a real pleasure and always shows me things that I would have missed otherwise. Um, I write a blog about what I find, although it's not a very good picture over there, but you can find it if you want to, I'll put a link on. Um, so for next year, I think my botanical challenge, not sure about, for this year I'd planned to do, uh, to visit a different nature reserve that I'd never been to before every month for the year and I did start off doing that quite well but then um, with everything else the pandemic really shook that so Durham Wildlife Trust has got 40 reserves of various sizes and I've only been about to about 10 of them I did visit a few new ones this year but um, which were within easy cycling distance but there's more to go I think though that looking at what I've put together for this, I think I really would like to go back to another reserve next year and, and follow it right through the year because I think what you learn from looking at the same place over and over again is, is much more than you learn by going in and seeing somewhere just as a one-off. So I'll just end by saying that this is obviously a really easy thing for anybody to do. Everybody has a local patch, whether you live in Teesside, whether you live high up in Teesdale, whether you live on the Durham coast, Wherever you live, there'll be somewhere local to the, you that you could go out and do something really similar. And I think you would probably find it a very positive experience. At which point I'm going to hand back to Fiona. Hi, thanks, Heather. That was um, that was absolutely um, brilliant. Um, it was really inspirational and um, uh, and like you say, just uh, lovely to look at those um, the changing seasons and uh, um, just remind us nature's just got that force that's ongoing no matter mm -hmm. no matter what's happening in the world. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, did you did you tend to go at the same time of day, or was it sort of quite sort of variable when you visited, or? It was it was really variable and I was fitting it around all the other stuff that I do so and also I didn't actually go at the same time every month even it just depended on how busy I was but what I mean when it was really hot in the summer I was going early in the morning because it was more pleasant and I suppose later in the year I was going later in the day just because it was a bit warmer <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't I wouldn't in any way describe it as a scientific study but it did I still got a, a picture of how things were changing I mean obviously if I'd done it rigorously um, at more regular intervals it would have been a more useful picture maybe in, in scientific terms but I still felt I was learning a lot about what was changing. Yeah and um, I think uh, it is just get, getting out and, and, and doing the, as, uh, as the, the sort of take home message if you like so yeah, and uh, I suppose I've got <laughs> I've, I've got a, a chance to um, put in a little plug for um, if people do get inspired to uh, um, get out and do, um, you know, sort of regularly visiting a, a little local to put in their records um, to Eric or, or another organisation. Um, yes, apologies for my poor presenting skills. I've got new respect for TV presenters now. So I just wanted to put in a little plug um, to ask you to send in your records. Records provide data and that data is information. And the, so the more data that is held, the better picture we have of, for example, species spread, species distribution, and then changes in spread and distribution. We could never as a society pay enough scientists and recorders to get out there and make all these observations. So citizen science and the general public getting out there, spotting things and sending information in is really important. Lots of species are under-recorded. So everything, any bits of information are important. And often people think we need, um, we just want information about unusual or rare species, but actually, 
sightings of common things are important as well. 30, 40 years ago, we weren't really thinking about hedgehog populations with any sense of concern, but now we know that they're in quite a precarious position. So something that's once common can change, but having the data provides facts and figures to measure those changes. You know, I'm sure we've all got stories of things like, oh yes, um, there used to be lesser spotted whatnots in Auntie Mary's field, but that can't be used, that information can't be used. So when you send data and our um, website and portal is set up to help you provide the information, we need sort of four main pieces of information. What the species is, or a picture that uh, helps to end it, who recorded it, where it was recorded and when it was recorded. So things like in what three words or grid references um, provide the information of the, on the location and the, the time is really just the day. So then that, that little packet of information can be used as actual fact. And people, it's all the, the information from the databases is used for conservation and research purposes. And it's a great way of actively um, working to help, especially if it's maybe a bit harder to, you might want to do something, but realistically getting up into um, a hillside and planting trees or, you know, putting dams to, to sort of help the peat bogs regenerate isn't maybe something that you can do, but spotting things even from your window out on your local walk and sending those records in is actually a really valuable and important thing to do. So send your records in or per, you know, to us at ERIC, or perhaps if you're interested in a particular set of organisms, you know, you could work and your records into something like, if you're interested in butterflies and moths, you might be sending them into an organization there or, you know, mammals, whatever, because, all of these organizations, most of us, we have like data sharing agreements where we can get data from them and they can get data from us so that everybody's working together to get that bigger picture as complete as possible. So back over to he me and Heather just finishing off the talk again. Thanks. Um, so he Heather, that was, um, that was great. Hopefully as well, people have been interacting in the, the chat section of, of the broadcast. And um, if you've got questions, you know, still send them us or, or to Heather, we'll have the contact details um, here at the end. Um, so Heather, I just, just want to say thanks um, so much for, for doing that talk. It's been uh, just a bit of a, a little bit of a light in a, in a dark time and, uh, and it's really given me some ideas and, uh, and inspiration for um, next year, but even I, think, I suppose you could start, you could start any time of year, really, eh? just yeah. to make that start. So thank you, Heather. You're welcome. I enjoyed doing it and it was a really positive experience going back through all the, the pictures and choosing the ones that I like best. So it was a positive thing for me to actually preparing it as well. All right. Oh, that's excellent. Good to know. So I'll just say thanks everyone for watching and um, we'll see you at the next talk. Thanks. Bye. Bye.